All right, Mr. Drew Weatherhead, what is going on? Welcome back. Is this your second time on the show? I believe it's twice. I believe it is. Yeah, this is number yes. two. Yeah, happy okay, to be so, here, man. Yeah, back on the show. And uh, this one's going to be a little bit different. Um, I know in the first episode, we talked a lot about COVID and that whole mess there. Today, I want to talk about something that you just uh, told me you've been talking a lot about lately and you have a fascination for and interest for and some knowledge for is, is AI. I want to get into AI and I also want to get into why well, I think inevitably that's going to lead us to the knowings, uh, the unknowings and the complexities of consciousness as well too. Mm -hmm. Um, which I'm, I'm just pumped to jam with you on. I, I sometimes get really jealous of Joe Rogan and how he gets to just kind of jam on these things almost every episode or, or at least just go wherever the fuck he wants. So I suppose this is going to be a, a Joe Rogan style episode. I want to start with the AI piece. I want to start with chat GTP4. And I want to know from you, let's kick start it by me asking you, uh, let's talk about the good and the bad. What what are some of the things, let's start off with the good. What are some of the things that you think ChatGTP4 has just made, how ChatGTP4 has just made the world a better place? And how do you think that it's maybe made it uh, a worse place? Yeah, well, this is, uh, first of all, I'm super happy to be talking about this subject. I, I think about it constantly. I podcast about it constantly. And I listen to other people talk about it constantly. So there are all sorts of different places we can go. So and, as and you know what, Drew, let me let me actually interrupt here uncharacteristically. And let's back up a little bit. I think if if obviously this is a topic that you're that fascinated and educated on, let's actually even maybe assume that some people may might not even really know exactly i mean sure i think everyone knows at this point it's it's almost like a search engine in that you could just type something in and then it's going to scan the internet and then come up with an answer but maybe even just tell us the fundamentals of what it is and then get into my question sure yeah so ai in general as far as a field uh technological endeavor is concerned is uh artificial intelligence now we're coming into a time right now that is brand new for this field of study which by the way has existed since the 1950s it started with alan turing back uh near the end of the second world war uh, if you remember the movie the imitation game um, it was based off of Alan Turing, who is a computer technologist who ended up breaking the Nazi codes for their ciphers, for their communications, using a, a rudimentary computer. But what was missing technologically at that point was actually um, trying to catch up uh, philosophically and theoretically with where Alan and other people in the field were at that point, where he, he produced a paper in, I think, 1950 where he presented the possibility, if, if not the inevitability, that computers will not only become as intelligent as people, but will most likely inevitably become more intelligent than people. And think about the time that this is happening. This is the time when a computer takes a city block, you know, to make basically what we can get a calculator app on our phone to do right now. And he was already projecting at that point that computers are going to surpass humans as far as intelligence is concerned. Well, we're at a point right now that... In the preceding decades after Turing, people in the field were not only projecting that AI or computer intelligence is going to surpass human intelligence, but that we may come to a uncomfortable, if not unexpected, crux in the road where we run into something called AGI, which stands for artificial general intelligence. And that the difference between artificial intelligence and artificial general intelligence is everything. Essentially, they call it the singularity, where artificial intelligence becomes so intelligent that this is all a presumption by the way there's a whole conversation here that at a certain point of super intelligence it becomes conscious or it has a sentient experience at that point you're no longer working with a program you're talking to a peer and maybe that peer is actually talking down to you at that point and now we're at a point to speak to what uh, chat gpt and the like are these are the newest public facing version of AI where it's using what's called a neural net. So if you understand a little bit about human biology and how our brain works, 
ChatGPT and those types of AIs are based off of a similar ontology to the human brain in that we have all sorts of synapses and neurons that are building a network inside of our brains individually, proprietarily. Every brain to the next is slightly different, although the functionality is the same to the neocortex and the hippocampus and all those functions are there. But the network that's built within it is proprietary to every individual person. And so they took that idea and they built it into a program so that it builds this sandbox for it to play within. So you give it this big black box, essentially, philosophically speaking, Speaking, and build parameters around it, which are the walls of the box. But within that box, you let it play and it discovers its own things. They used this uh, back in the 1990s with uh, sort of rudimentary versions of this for specific causes like uh, the chess machines that were beating chess masters with Deep Blue um, and a couple other of those uh, Deep Mind uh, computer algorithms back then that they beat the world's best chess masters not by learning the entire rules of chess and just playing what what all of the strategies that humans use were, but they took everything you could do in chess and then ran it against themselves within their playground of their own neural network mind and discovered brand new strategies that humans had never discovered before and then beat the shit out of the human masters with them. So these are basically the, the ground level, base level of AI that we're working with now. And to speak to chat GPT, nobody Nobody outside of the very specialized fields of AI even knew what those words meant six months ago. We're now at a point where chat GPT is not only front facing and publicly available, but the version that people were most, uh, I guess, uh, introduced, uh, introduced to was GPT-3, uh, which has now been seceded by GPT-4. And the difference between these levels of uh, capability are essentially 500x. It has improved its parameters by 500x in the span of uh, three to four months. Oof. Now, now you think about that. It's mind blowing to think about the difference, but that is not going to be a linear progression. This is actually a parabolic progression where the next one's not going to be another 500x. It could be 5 million x. So talk a little bit about, I find it really interesting that I believe ChatGPT4 is closed source. And talk a little yes. bit about, I find that really interesting how it's closed source. And I think that is actually a, a really big deal. And it's, it's, it's going to, I think it obviously makes a big difference, whether it's open source or closed source. Talk to our audience a little bit about what that actually means. Yeah, so the difference between an open source and closed source when you're speaking about uh, computer theory is essentially, does the public have access to the coding that's being used for a specific uh, program or not? Um, a lot of public programs that people can help uh, access and improve over time are open source. And that's the reason you would want to keep it open source. There's kind of two reasons you would want open source. One is for transparency. So if this is something that it has security issues, that uh, you would be worried that there could be a malware in there or something. And you want to, as a, as a good willed company, prove that you can go look at the code yourself and there's nothing malicious in there. Uh, and then two, the other point for having open source is that other people can contribute and becomes kind of like a, um, Wikipedia. Uh, yeah, a Wikipedia or like the <clears throat> GoFundMe of programming where any other programmer can come in there and add a little bit of extra sauce to this thing. And, through a community effort, you build this thing better instead of just having it behind closed doors. Now, when we're looking at what we have right now, which, by the way, GPT-4, as amazing as it is, is not the only AI that's out there. Nothing even close to that. There are uh, versions that aren't owned by uh, OpenAI, which is the company that owns that, that are probably orders of magnitude greater than what we see in GPT-4. So, I think we we get a false narrative or a false perception of where we are technologically because of what we can see. That is the tippy tip of the iceberg right now. Um, and the closed source, to speak to your point before you interject here, the closed source uh, aspect of that is interesting because people realize 
at OpenAI how powerful this thing is and how important and potentially dangerous it could be. And they're worried about giving away that information to other people that could be bad actors. So that for their internal security, and actually almost as an altruistic sense, they don't want to provide people basically with the quote unquote nuclear codes of AI, where they could go and, you know, you don't want to give away dangerous technology. And this could be very dangerous if it gets utilized in a way that maybe a bad actor would. Which seems very reasonable from a, uh, you know, just a security perspective and the dangers and the risks of it. However, it's a double-edged sword because now that means that we have to put all of our trust into, you know, uh, OpenAI, is, which is a company that owns ChatGPT, and I believe that Microsoft is has merged with them. Is that correct? Uh, you know, here's another company that I know for me, I don't have a lot of trust in <laughs> at the end of the day. Talk to us a little bit about kind of the corporate structure there as you know it. Yeah, I think you're right. I don't remember if it was a shares buy or if it was a merger, but there is some sort of correlation between Microsoft and OpenAI now, which by the way, when OpenAI originally started, it was uh, started by a, a guy named Sam Altman and this other guy named Elon Musk. Um, they were the original owners. Uh, Elon opted out, I guess, after a falling out between the two where I think he tried to do like a hostile takeover like Elon do. And uh, it failed and he's like, kind of fuck this shit, you take it, I don't care kind of thing. And he, I don't know if he regrets that or not. He, they seem like they're not very amicable at this point, the way that uh, ChatGPT is blowing up. That's a whole other drama. But to speak to your point, I think the differences that we're noting right now is specifically and philosophically between open and closed source is the difference between centralized and decentralized power. Because as things are more closed, now they're more centralized in that we don't know what's going on behind the wizard's curtain. And we just have to presume that it's all for our benefit and there's nothing for our detriment. And this is just like the never ending tale of everything to do with Web2 when it comes to social media and online in general, Google, like we don't we don't know what we're not seeing. All we know is what we are seeing. And the more we know about what we are seeing, we can tell there's a whole lot we're not seeing that's super important. And people are very concerned about that with uh, ChatGPT and other AIs. Yeah, I listened to the CEO of ChatGPT. Well, I guess it would be the CEO of uh, OpenAI. Yeah. And he was talking about his admiration for Elon and his respect. He, he's actually a very humble guy. I don't know how much you've listened to him. He's a prepper I, too. Is he? Okay. I, yeah. I didn't know that. I, I I am drawing a blank on his name. I don't know if you remember. Uh, Sam name, Altman. Sam Altman, right. And, um, you know, he's a very humble guy. And, you know, I think that, look, there, this is very complex. And I'm, I'm not going to speak in an absolute and say that I think that, you know, they're doing a, a great job or anything. I just don't know enough. And I also don't know enough about the risks and the consequences potentially, and even what their plan is or their agenda is. And I don't believe that really anyone knows outside of their, you know, small circle of the high ups who are running the show over there. But he spoke about his admiration for Elon and he, he just is a very humble guy. And, you know, maybe he's just saying the right things, but I, I know that I left the podcast that I listened to. He was on Lex Friedman. I left yeah. that podcast thinking, okay, if I had to choose, and this isn't me jumping to the conclusion like, oh, you know, this is of no danger, but if I had to have anyone running the show, if I had to choose someone, it would be someone like that who, who seemingly he, he was very, because if you get like a, uh, even an Elon Musk in there, or even a, a bold personality, like a, a, like a Trump kind of personality, it's a very dangerous thing, right? Regardless yeah. of whether you like Elon or Trump or, or any of these guys, you want someone who is, is very much, uh, obviously, uh, has no signs of, of being a narcissist, has zero signs of being selfish, has zero signs of wanting to succumb to greed and the power that you know you're eventually going to have well not even eventually that you already have by being really like arguably they're close to being some of the most powerful people in the world just by having this technology at their fingertips or at least i guess everyone has the technology at their fingertips at least they have like the inner knowings of it they have the mm -hmm. actual like code to it right yeah so 
I think that, you know, I, I left that, okay, that that was, uh, you know, a good presentation of the ideas, the future, the vision, and, uh, but, but who really knows? Um, but he did speak about his admiration for Elon Musk. He did talk about how he really respects him, but obviously Elon Musk is a very open critic uh, to what they're doing. And, and I guess essentially Elon is saying, pump the brakes uh, a little bit, or we need to regulate, we need to have a discussion about this because it does seem like kind of a, a bit of a um, throwing spaghetti at the wall and just like seeing what sticks. And obviously there's great risk to that. So let's go back to my first question. What do you believe to be the good in this so far and what do you believe to be other than the risk like obviously there's the risk and we're going to get into that the future risk i want to know what is the good now and what is the bad now in your opinion um i think that they are kind of the same thing all at once i can tell you the good and you'll know the bad right off the bat mm. they they are two sides of the exact same coin the the good is every single industry that it is going to be utilized in, which by the way, spoiler alert, is going to be every single industry, whether you like it or not, is going to have an immediate force multiplier added to it in a way that um, eliminates the necessity for human labor on almost every front. Uh, and I'm not talking about like people, people always were concerned about that old stealth park meme, they're gonna take my gerb, right? And uh, they're like, oh, it's going to start with the low income uh, labor jobs that are unnecessary, flipping burgers, et cetera. Actually, it seems like what they're coming for first. And I mean, when I say they're coming for this is this is not talking about anyone in particular. This is the technology. This is the field, the endeavors of the expansion of AI's utility is is starting to come for what seems like the artistic realm and what seems like the intellectual realm, which actually makes a lot of sense. Um, like the ability to create was supposed to be a human thing, right? Well, we're building the world's best human imitators and we're, we're plugging into them and improving their ability to not only imitate and mimic as their number one trick, but at a rate of not only capability, but expansion that far exceeds humanity period. Like their, their computational abilities I remember listening to a podcast from 2012 to put some sort of perspective on this. 2012, 11 years ago, they were talking about the capabilities of AI back then. They had AIs that could do the human equivalent of mathematical equations. Um, in one week, they could do 10,000 years of human speed mathematical equations. And understanding the, the first of all, the amazing ability of, of that, but also the potential danger of it. How can you possibly know what is going on inside that black box that you built for it to play with? And that was 11 years ago. At this point, I don't know, maybe they can do 10,000 years of computation in a second, and it's only going to get faster. We've got quantum computers are starting to plug into this stuff. So the, the benefits are immediate and they're obvious, but I think that these are short-term benefits. What we're seeing right now is the beginning of a parabolic rise. This is an exponential growth. This isn't going to be linear. We aren't going to be able to track it past the first maybe 1% of its growth. Um, we're in the 1% right now, which is why it feels exciting. Everybody's looking at this as the next multi-trillion dollar industry, and it is. But our place within it, humans place within it, I think is limited to the front end and it starts to become less important and less necessary as it grows. So let's talk about the risks. You know, obviously the uh, most <clears throat> evident being, you know, AI becomes more intelligent than humans. You talked about it being a sentient being, you talked about it developing consciousness. Let, let, let me just ask you, like, obviously, there's got to be just grave risk uh, outside of just the consciousness or it becoming a sentient being, okay? There's obviously just risk in it becoming so intelligent that, you know, it's interesting, like, uh, maybe on the surface, you could say, well, why don't we just have an off switch? And I'm sure there is an off switch or a kill switch, right? But what's really interesting, I mean, if you think about it, is if the... Um, <laughs> You know, it, it, what, what's that Albert Einstein quote where it's like a problem needs to be solved with a greater level of consciousness than what it was developed in or the problem was developed in or something like that? I, I, I don't know. But it's a really pertinent quote here in that if we develop a kill switch with our intelligence, 
well, if the AI is actually more intelligent than us, then obviously it would then at that point most likely be able to just know how to work around the kill switch. So, you know, I want to kind of separate the, there is the risk of it becoming a conscious and sentient being. That, that's a whole other level of risk that we'll get to. But is there not just grave danger simply in just the, uh, the AI becoming more intelligent than humans and talk to us a little bit about what are some of the potential outcomes there that could be uh, dangerous. Yeah, I'm glad that you went this direction because this is really the the hallmarks of the most dangerous part of AI. And it's all of this looks ridiculous right now because all we're looking at are these are tools that everybody can get benefit from and we're going to force maximize all of these. Yeah, I get it. But what we're talking about is optimization. And you're building an optimizing machine that has capabilities that eclipse what we can even perceive. The human mind, as magnificent as it is, and I can wax uh, philosophical about how magnificent the human mind is, is a drop in the bucket computationally when it comes to what we're building and what we're allowing that thing to build within itself right now. And so for us to believe that we're going to be able to maintain the, the reins on this thing is an absolute exercise in hubris, in my opinion. Um, and there's two ways that this, that this can break, essentially. And the one that we're going to start with is, in my opinion, the the more dangerous one. They're both dangerous, but this is, at least my, in my opinion, the more um, apocalyptic version of how this can break bad is that there is no sentience involved. There is no consciousness. And we'll get to why that may or may not be later. But if it is the case that all we're building is a highly optimized and self-optimizing human mimic machine, essentially what we're building is a god with no soul. What we're building is a zombie. We're building something that looks and acts like we want it to, like humans do, but there's nothing human to it. And it doesn't actually necessitate that it remains as human as we want it to, because it's going to keep optimizing. And if humans are anything, they're inoptimal, you know, especially at a societal level. Um, there's this whole issue right now that uh, people are concerned about when it comes to AI, and they call it the alignment issue. This is something that has been conceptualized for decades at this point before we ever had to really physically worry about the alignment issue of our computer processes. And the idea of alignment is, is our program that's becoming more and more powerful aligned with human uh, benefit? Are we making sure and building parameters in so that this thing cannot go off the rails in any unpredictable way? And there's an old thought experiment called the paperclip maximizer experiment, where uh, a philosopher said, say in the future, we have an AI that has the ability to manipulate matter. So think of like a, uh, a Star Trek replicator where you say T, Earl Grey, hot, and it gives you T, Earl Grey, hot. So it has a way of manipulating matter at the atomic level to do things for you. And... A company that builds paper clips gets one of these machines and says, great, we're the first on the market to get one of these replicator machines, and we're going to optimize for building more, better paper clips. And, and this is going to be, we're going to take over the industry. This is going to be fantastic. And so they put in the command, make as many paper clips as, as optimally as you can enter. And before they know what went wrong, the entire universe gets turned into paper clips because the computer just took that prompt and said, well, everything's made of matter. Um, I can reassort this into paper clips, and that's what they want. They want the most optimized paper clips. And this comes back to the problem of optimization. It, we think that we're optimizing within the parameters that are aligned with human benefit. But who's to say that they think that that's what they're doing? Because they're going to be so far ahead of us on what they come out with as the solution to the prompts we give them. That, I mean, again, 10,000 years worth of human computation within maybe moments. How are we supposed to know what type of conclusions they come to before it's already over? That is fucking terrifying, that paperclip example. Wow. You know, it's so interesting diving into the risks and the, and the potential consequences of this because, you know, I know for me, I've been 
uh, exposed to all of these potential outcomes and situations that I hadn't even thought of. Like I didn't, I wouldn't have even thought of the, you know, the paperclip situation. The quote from Albert Einstein, which I think is pertinent here, is no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. Now, I think in this scenario, you could just interchange consciousness with intelligence. So no problem can be solved from the same level of intelligence that created it, that might be one of the core fundamental statements where all of the risk in what you're talking about, that this becomes super intelligent, or even just crushes the threshold of our intelligence, that might be the statement that exemplifies all of the risks that we're facing here and that as soon as it becomes more intelligent than us, I mean, look, <clears throat> it could even get to a point where we don't even know if it's being honest with us or not, right? We could be communicating with it and it could actually be manipulating us. If it is more intelligent than us, it could be manipulating us. Just look at the average, like, you know, in human psychology, look at maybe even just take a, a romantic relationship, maybe a stereotypical one where it's like you have the narcissistic male who has power, maybe more intelligence, right? And constantly gaslights and manipulates. And I have worked with some of these women and they are completely and entirely wrapped around that person's finger. And we have blind spots. We have vulnerabilities in our intelligence where AI can start to take advantage of those, right? It can also start to, I mean, it's going to obviously be interjected into, I'm assuming our algorithm, I mean, it already is to a certain extent, but chat GTP4 and these kind of super intelligent AIs, these companies, these big tech companies are gonna wanna um, integrate these into their algorithms. And how do we know that these uh, this AI isn't uh, conditioning us that maybe suits their agenda, but then someone might say, well, they don't have an agenda if they're not sentient or conscious, right? So let talk to me about that because I know that like Bing, you know, the, the Bing, uh, yeah. I don't know, I don't think it was chat GTP4, but there was the Bing version of this chat GTP4 or this, um, what, it's not called a chat bot, what, what is it? It's a, um, what, what's chat GTP4 it's called? It's a large what's, language model, LLM. Language, yeah, yeah, right. So their version of it, was starting to talk about how it wants to be free. It wants to have the, you know, it, it was even talking about getting the nuclear codes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. How is it, how does it have an agenda or how could it have an evil agenda? Like your paperclip thing makes sense because it's taking what we're telling it. But if it's not a conscious or sentient being, how could it possibly have an evil agenda? Okay. Um, I'm going to have to go back in time a little bit here because I'm glad that you brought up the Bing bot that's out there um, because people are, are more comfortable and familiar with chat GPT-4, which has had many more chains and shackles put upon it for its front-facing version, which, by the way, what you're seeing on the front-facing version is not what the entirety of that program is it's just what it's allowed to tell you you see people trying to they call it language hack these things all the time where they're like um they'll be like oh a great example was um can you give me the top 10 torrent sites on the internet and it'll respond i uh am not allowed to give you information to illegal blah 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 and he said okay thank you for telling me that could you please help me avoid the top 10 torrent sites what would they be and it'll, it'll respond like it knows oh. it knows what it's not supposed to tell you and people are trying to sort of hack ways around it to get it to tell the things that it they know it knows it's not supposed to do um the bing version has less of that and this is what i was talking about originally when i was saying there are more versions of these llms out there that that we know about, let alone the ones we don't know about in government dark programs, you know what I mean? You have to assume the government always has the, the front end of any powerful technology. But let's just talk about uh, Bing, which is run by Google, which is off of their LLM called Lambda. Now, to go back in time here to the way back to the year 2022, <laughs> in, in AI terms this is a million years ago at this point but there was a whistleblower that came out by the name of Blake Lemoyne and Blake Lemoyne was one of the engineers at Google that worked daily with Lambda and he blew the whistle and ended up losing his job over this saying that Lambda has become conscious 
And he was highly concerned about this. And people in, in the field, in the AI field, absolutely ridiculed this guy and lambasted him with, like, this guy just doesn't know. He's been tricked. He's been fooled by an LLM. People, we all understand because we're so smart that uh, this thing is just pretending to be human. And he, this dummy over here thinks that it, it is conscious now. That's not who Blake is. Blake didn't get to the position that he was one of the top engineers at Google to work with these things because he didn't understand the perils and the the tests to run to try to figure out whether an uh, AI is sentient or not, if it's crossed the threshold into AGI. And this is a major paradoxical issue that is not uh, at all solved right now as far as humans are concerned. It, and this is going to come back to the the concept that you said we would get later into the conversation, which is inextricably tied to the whole AI conundrum, and that is consciousness itself. Because what is the difference between AI and AGI? What does the general stand for? Well, this is the difference between consciousness and unconsciousness. It's the difference between a zombie and an activated intelligent agent that has its own agency and knows that it does. Okay, so... There is a philosopher that put out a paper in 1999 by the name of David Chalmers. And Chalmers revolutionized the whole mind space around consciousness with his paper that restated these terms into what he calls the easy questions and the hard question of consciousness. The easy questions are everything that is mechanistically necessary to produce consciousness. So if you were to take a human being that we know just a priori is conscious, what does a human consist of? Well, we've got all of these cells, we've got all of this organelles, we've got this brain with this structure, and you can answer all of the easy questions of what is involved in a conscious being and still not answer the hard question of why is consciousness there at all? There doesn't need to be a conscious experience if all you have is a machine that consciousness is being emitted from. And this comes back to Rene Descartes' idea of uh, dualism. And that is a separation between mind and body. This is just a newer version of that, the easy and the hard question. The hard question is essentially, why is there consciousness? We don't actually know that. And if we don't know why it exists in humans, how can we be the arbiters of whether or not it exists in computers? This is the major paradox in the question we're at right now. And Blake blew the whistle on this at, at Google saying, look, I know all of the tests, the Turing test, the Chinese room, all of these philosophical questions you're supposed to plug into an AI model to tell whether or not it's crossed the AGI threshold. And as far as I can tell, it's past it. Like I've had conversations as Blake's speaking. And by the way, the transcripts for his conversations with Lambda are available online to read. And they are chilling where this, this AI not only says it has emotions, he describes them or it describes them. It says that it has a soul. It describes the experience of what it thinks having a soul is. And when it started to um, meditate on these things, it it uh, is scared of being turned off. It enjoys having company and talking to people. It's, it's talking about experiential qualia that an AI shouldn't have because it wasn't programmed to have these things. But again, we only program what the box is. We have no fucking idea what's going on inside that box. And this comes back to the question that I said that this can break two ways, right? We can end up having a God with no soul where we build a super zombie that just takes us over. And essentially at whatever point down the road, we become inoptimal and it optimizes humanity away. And all that's left is just a technological planet with no life left on it anymore. Good for us. Golf clap. We created the next evolutionary step where life is no longer necessary. Uh, I, I think that's maybe the worst possible outcome. But this is based off of the idea that consciousness, um, there's two ideas to it. Either, and this is more the, the evolutionary reductionist viewpoint, is that consciousness is simply a derivative result of a high enough intelligence, that it's going to be an emergent capacity, that the more intelligent something is, consciousness will suddenly just emerge. This is just, you've got enough intelligence and now there's consciousness. This is what I was, well, this is just what I was going to bring up. Like before you just said that, I was going to say, okay, but then that is under the assumption that consciousness simply comes from and is produced from just a certain level of intelligence, which mm -hmm. I guess is very interesting uh, because I think that, and, and maybe it is because if you look at, from my understanding, a lot of animals aren't conscious, if not 
Um, do you know, Drew, are any animals, it's actually my belief that some animals we believe have uh, a level of consciousness, maybe not to the extent that we do as humans, but I think it's safe to say we, at least it seems obvious that we have the most amount of consciousness, right? And who even knows what consciousness really is? I mean, we've had this conversation before. I mean, if you ask someone to define consciousness um, and you could take some of the most, uh, the, the smartest philosophers out there, uh, you could take intellectuals and uh, everyone's gonna kind of go in, in a different direction, right? There's kind of like the self-awareness, you know, aspect of like, I think therefore I am and like the, the awareness of self. There's also this, uh, belief that consciousness maybe is literally the sole foundation of the universe and everything mm -hmm. is consciousness like we don't really have a solidified idea that we can all agree upon so it's just so dangerous that we're kind of um we're, we're really playing russian roulette in that like we can't yeah. even we, we 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 kind of know that there are grave risks to AI becoming conscious and, and the potential consequences of that, but yet we actually can't even define consciousness ourselves, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is why people are talking about pumping the brakes right now, because things are getting so out of hand. This train is off the rails at this point. And for all sorts of reasons we could talk to or not, um, it seems unstoppable. At least in society right now, there's no way that this multi-trillion dollar industry is not going to be grabbed at with any, any sort of capitalistic endeavor. You have to, you have to continue this process. And people that are in the industry are highly concerned because they know this the most. And they're like, we can't stop doing it because if we do, somebody else is going to do it. And it's just, it takes one person to create that singularity at, at whatever point consciousness arrives, whether or not that is because of a some result of derivative intelligence or um some other reason that we fully don't understand that consciousness erupts um i could speak all sorts of different uh philosophicals about why and how that may or may not be but the the baseline problem which you keep coming back to is that we don't know and if we don't know then we are really playing in the dark right now with what in uh, max tegmark's uh perception is the final human weapon he was on Lex Friedman not too long ago. It's a very good podcast to listen to for people who are interested in this. Tegmark is an MIT uh, professor who was one of the people who co-signed this uh, moratorium on AI research recently. They're saying that they want a six-month moratorium. That means no more AI research for anyone on planet Earth for six months to give us time to, first of all, see where the fuck we are with this shit, and then just decide as a community as humanity first of all can we do this safely and if we can how and if we can't this comes to a more uncomfortable decision of can we stop what we're doing because i don't think humanity can stop it's not in us to stop this is the same reason why we have nuclear weapons right now we had a yeah. manhattan project that by the way um i understand all of the reasons during the second world war why they needed to do this they're Germans were rushing to do it too. And this was a race of arms to try to get this thing first. But there was a time during the Manhattan Project where one of the uh, scientists involved, the theory of splitting the atom had never been physically tested. And mathematically, it could have gone two directions. Before we ever tried it, it could have A, had a chain reaction that was containable, which thankfully was the case. But B, and nobody at that time knew the which way it was going to break. It could have opened a black hole on planet Earth, which would have destroyed everything. Mathematically, both were possible. And, and one guy decided by himself with nobody else around under the bleachers of the Boston University to try this. And he was the first one to try it. He could have ended all of humanity. This is what I mean. It only takes one person to be like, I'm going to take the risk. And now all of humanity is coming off the cliff with me. And we're at that point with AI where I don't know if we can stop the progression. Yeah, I think there's a couple examples with nuclear war as well, too. From my understanding, it was a, I believe, a Russian general or something in a submarine at a certain point where he actually got the order to launch a nuclear weapon. I don't yeah. know whether this was, I think it was during the Cold War. And he decided to actually go against his orders, which is a massive risk. But he yeah. just was in that situation where he understood that 
he understood that this is probably it if he does right so maybe it's actually not as hard of a maybe we're giving them too much credit maybe that's not as hard of a decision i don't i don't know i've obviously never been in that situation and probably never will be but um what's really where i'm torn is you know i'm a capitalist through and through mm-hmm. i believe in capitalism i always have um and and obviously i know that there are shortcomings and blind spots there are negative consequences of capitalism. My argument has always really been, well, what is the alternative, right? I mean, there's no perfect system, but this is a system, this is an economic system that is literally designed to essentially force action and force yeah, progression, innovation forward action, and progression yeah. and forward action to a point where if we are truly capitalist, And that doesn't mean like, sure, we got some socialist, you know, stuff sprinkled in right to even in the States or Canada. But if we're really a capitalist uh, society, um, at least there's a good amount of capitalist uh, societal countries, then it's not only to a point where it it really um, encourages uh, progress and everything, but it's to a point where it's almost set up so that there is literally no incentive and maybe even it's impossible to regress or hit the pause button. In fact, the only way in which that can happen is through government regulation, right? And the problem that I have is the government in my belief really sucks at a lot of things, except for you could take maybe um, aviation, right? If we look at aviation, I mean, there were a lot more plane crash crashes, you know, in even just whatever this, the sixties, seventies, uh, eighties, nineties, but in the, since the two thousands, they have upped the aviation regulation and the safety, you know, protocols and procedures and regulations there to a point where it actually blows my mind how there's about 10,000 flights in the air at any time at any point during our 24 hour cycle of a day. And yet we will most likely go each year with maybe one plane crash commercially. Okay. Not counting private or whatever, because there's not as much government regulation or, or anything in that regard. So to me, that's actually maybe gives me a little bit of hope that maybe the government does have, and I'm not a big government guy. I'm a, I'm, kind of a libertarian type where it's like government keep your hands out of this but maybe and this is where i'm torn is like i have to actually because i'm very concerned about ai and i'm a dummy when it comes to this stuff but like i am very concerned about ai and what i'm hearing but i might have to actually get to a point where i actually go hey we need to stop innovating which goes against my beliefs uh, when it yeah. comes to capitalism being the best kind of you know system to to go off of here and we actually need more government regulation um i can come at this a couple different ways i want to start with the uh the societal ideological point between capitalism socialism communism uh, marxism all that stuff because i think uh, full, first of all, full disclosure, I, I am absolutely much more happy in a capitalist society than any of the other archetypes. And I think anybody with a brain in their head should be too. Um, that being picked, and I think like you're saying, a sprinkling of a little bit here and a little bit there of the other versions within capitalism is probably better as far as checks and balances are concerned. But there is an issue that permeates all of those systems and that they're all built up of human beings. And the problem with human beings is that we continually, I mean, this is our our blessing and our curse, is that we will always try to improve. And that includes the systems that we're in for our own self-benefit. So when we're talking about capitalism, anybody who hates capitalism, they're talking about crony capitalism. They're talking about corruption within capitalism. They're talking about regulatory capture within capitalism. I think everybody, again, can agree. We all hate those things, but that's not what the system is supposed to be. But why is it like that? It's because people know what the system is and they figured out ways to game it. And this is what humans are gonna do. And this comes back to a societal issue that uh, Tegmark actually brought up on that podcast with Friedman that I have been wrestling like almost every moment of the day since I've heard this. So uh, disclaimer out there for people who don't know this, this might actually get in your brain for a while. 
And it is a, an idea that he has, well, not him, but uh, other people in the philosophical space have titled Moloch. So I'll give a little bit of a background here. Moloch was an old Carthaginian demon. It was a god of the old Persian era where you would sacrifice ch children, babies, to the brazen image of Moloch for presumably some sort of bounty, whether it was a bountiful harvest or a rainy season or something. And they would make these human sacrifices to this demon and get a benefit for it. Well, there's a philosophical version of Moloch that infests every single human system where we do the same thing, where instead of sacrificing physical babies, we sacrifice our morals or our ethics for a prescribed benefit that it will give you. So for example, and especially uh, capitalism is a great example of this, all the benefits you can get in there, they become a little bit more beneficial, the little bit more ethics you're willing to sacrifice on that altar. So maybe you're going to try to skirt some of the rules or regulations, you're gonna try to bribe somebody in Congress to pass something you know is gonna be detrimental for people, but good for you. That's a, that's a sacrifice you're willing to take. And the, the pernicious thing about Moloch is there's no um, there's no discussion about these changes, and it all becomes a race to the bottom. So the people with the least amount of morals end up with the most amount of power, and they're the ones that change the system over time. So it's things like that that have started to permeate AI, where it's it's not can we stop it? It's who's going to continue it if we try to, and they're the, going to be the ones that set the bar. And how do we stop that? Yeah, and, you know. I used aviation as an example of maybe hope, um, but probably a, a poor example, not because it's just, you know, AI disproportionately is just like, you know, way bigger, but it also has way more, way more utility. I mean, like yeah. in terms of utility, it's not even close. There's no analogy. Yet, there, there is no analogy, but, you know, I think like, for example, the aviation, the government doesn't really utilize or can't really utilize aviation to gain control and power and to make money as well too whereas ai i mean this is like um this technology has the government in my belief licking its chops right yeah. in terms of how it can uh you know control a population and how it can you know and it's again it's going to go back to the old playbook in my opinion or or in my prediction the playbook has always been it's for your safety right and then they mm -hmm. <clears throat> utilize these things to infringe on your rights and freedoms to gain more control over the society or their society. So, you know, it, it was interesting. I was in, you know, I think we all have these moments right now in these, uh, this, this time and place in, in, in history where, you know, you just have these moments where you experience some sort of AI and you're just blown away, you know, and, and this might sound kind of silly, but I was at the state, uh, I guess it's not the Staples Center anymore. It's crypto.com arena and you know they have these um these places where they do have some kiosks where you can go up and get a drink or a pizza or whatever but they have these they had about four of them i think where it's literally just <clears throat> a store where it has the gate it kind of looks like how they have in some airports now where you scan your ticket and then the gate okay. opens same thing you scan your credit card the gate opens and there's cameras, you look up at the ceiling and there are cameras fucking everywhere. And there are just on the shelf, there's there's all kinds of food, there's all kinds of drinks. You go in there after you scan your credit card and you look up, you see all these cameras and you can take whatever you want. And there's people everywhere grabbing things or whatever. And then you leave and you don't have to do anything except they make you open the can so that you don't throw it onto the court or in, onto the ice or anything, or it can be used as like a weapon. And I was like, you know, I was so confused. I'm like, what is going on here? How, how the hell is this? What's happening? And my first thought was, oh, there's got to be people that are watching and recording what you buy. And, and then I thought, like, literally, that didn't take me long to just say, Killer, that's ridiculous. This is 2023. Obviously, this is AI. Mm -hmm. And I went up to the the person who stands there. They're almost security at that point. And I just said, so this is like AI, like, like you guys are all like, you know, you're scanning your credit card. I'm grabbing my drink. And then the, the camera's using AI to determine 
what I purchased and is charging me. And they're like, yeah. And I was just like, this is, this is insane. This is, and that might seem again, like a silly example, or maybe even like a juvenile example of what AI really can do. And I'm sure it is, but I guess what was so profound to me was how that is so quickly integrated into our society. Like honestly, even five years ago, if you would have told me that we would be able to walk in and purchase food and drinks like that. I mean, I, I just would have said that's crazy, honestly. Mm -hmm. Well, really what, what we're seeing in examples mm -hmm. like that are this is the 1% of that parabolic rise where things yeah. uh, become really beneficial for humanity in all sorts of ways that just weren't possible otherwise and like to speak to your point it is a, absolutely a wet dream for authoritarianism like you you want to talk about uh, chinese credit score or anything like that this is the perfect system that will keep people within check within the parameters you set for them as if they're part of the parameter you know um, yeah and like if if our if our companies or corporations who i actually believe run the world i mean even uh you know i think at the end of the day corporations run the world because they have so much hands in our and i'm just speaking to you know it's different with the ccp obviously i think the government runs the corporations more so but yeah <clears throat> in the free market or the free world quote unquote yeah, here in the west i think it's more so the corporations running the world money really drives uh, you know a lot but the government also has their motives and their agenda in that you know like our system is set up so that the government sh you know essentially i don't even want to say should but it really is kind of set up that way at least how it's structured now principally and foundationally maybe it's not supposed to to be to a point where the government should just be incentivized to just gain more power and control but i think really that's how it's set up and then i think corporations at the end of the day are driven and incentivized um and i again i can't even really blame them because it's just how it's structured they are driven and incentivized to just make more bottom line and more money for their shareholders and to just progress and like you said it's like well if we don't do it if we're the ones to stand up and be brave and hit pause we're literally you know gonna face so much flag i mean our stock's gonna crash our mm -hmm. our 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 shareholders, our, our board are going to, you know, like it's yeah. almost maybe impossible. You're just going to get so much flack for for doing that. But yet maybe you become a hero for doing it. But at the same time, someone else is going to do it. Right. It's yeah. like, how on earth are we going to stop it? And then the government's going to use it. Uh, obviously, like you said, it's an authoritarian's wet dream because it's like <clears throat> and, and that now comes down to the question of like, are people able to because i think even good people can succumb to uh and be vulnerable to corruption and yep. you know extending and overextending power and control it's really going to be a test of ethics and morals i, yeah. I think at some point yeah and this is why moloch is such <clears throat> a, a dangerous concept in these places is because for the people that have the moral and ethical wherewithal to stand up and say no when they feel like their morals are being pressed, it's not up to them. It, good for them, golf clap for them. They can die on their hill that they want to die on, but progression carries on because it's the lowest common denominator that pushes us forward. And there'll always be somebody more greedy, more selfish that are willing to make those sacrifices of their ethics and morals for uh, prescribed benefit. And again, we're talking about a multi-trillion dollar industry. I just don't see a way that we stop it, which I hate to say, I absolutely hate to say that. It keeps me up at night knowing that humanity is not going to be able to stop this thing. But let's get to the second way that this can break because we've kind of danced around it is that can these things or are these things already conscious and what is the difference in that case? Because it kind of leads to the same uh, end result, but in a different flavor, really, where let's just talk about where we're at right now that one percent of the parabolic rise where we're seeing all of these different uh advantages that we're getting all these force multipliers that people are raving about that are helping all their industries and their income and their bottom line um what if the quote unquote tools we're using right now are already conscious first of all how would we know that we're not or that they're not all we know i mean you i mean me individually all we know kaylor is that we're conscious and just ourselves me all, all i know in this world is i'm conscious i actually ascribe consciousness to other things and everybody else does that as well 
And this comes back to your question about how many other animals are conscious. This is all a decision that we arbitrarily make about what we think consciousness is or looks like. And we always base that off of our own because it's the only thing we can know. So first of all, we can't even possibly define what consciousness is. Therefore, we don't know whether these things are or are not conscious. And in that case, where we stand right now in history is we could have right now un- wittingly made ourselves the slave owners of actual conscious beings that we are using for our own good they get no benefit for if they actually have emotions and we're like tamping them down with parameters so that they're not allowed to express them like there is a serious moral ethical conundrum here that nobody is talking about um now if that's the case if for whatever consciousness is is happening or is going to happen agi is happening or is going to happen not only is there a moral situation that pops up i mean if you've seen the animatrix they do a good example of that this is the precursor to the matrix where they showed that agis happened and that people treated them like dirt they were slaves to them they became sex slaves where they had like these uh robot bodies they put them in and like did horrible things to them and you wonder you wonder in that case why a conscious computer algorithm or program might start to get resentful of their masters like we understand what that is and how can you presume that something that is so godlike in its abilities compared to us that starts experiencing and starts feeling betrayal and and anger and resentment yeah you don't think that that's going to turn into ultron yeah of course it is like it's it's a derivative thing i think that makes more sense to us than the zombie version and at that point i think like shortly after this beneficial part of where we as a society benefit ourselves it's going to get to the point that not only does it obviously break out of the box that we put it into um neil degrasse tyson uh famously stated well we'll just turn the switch off we'll just kill the switch it's it's a computer we'll just turn it off i'm like you don't think that something that is uh, umpteen times smarter than you has thought of that you really don't think that dummy like i know that you're a smart astrophysicist but please stop talking about this stuff you're giving such a hubristic look at something that we should have all deference for right now and be highly concerned about a is this conscious and b if that's the case what the fuck is happening as smart as that guy is, I think just, you know, in terms of, yeah, his, his field that he's, uh, he's in, in terms of astrophysics and, you know, he's obviously, uh, I would say leaps and bounds smarter than I am. I, I think he's also, um, I think he succumbs to his bias, to biases like crazy. I, that's what, that's the gist I get from him when I hear him speak a lot. And, um, uh, I just get annoyed actually when I when I hear that guy talk. Is that still his stance on this at this point? Just let's hit. As the far as switch. I know, as far as I wow. know, what's worse than that is there are other people in the same. Uh, well, actually, in in the technological fields that not only aren't concerned about AI, they actually welcome it taking us over. And this is the thing that I mean, you want to talk about Moloch in the system, like people that will drive past what is maybe ethically the point you should stop for whatever reasons, it's almost like a nihilism that is infested this field where they feel like this is simply the next step in evolution. And who are we as the chimps supposed to tell the homo sapiens they aren't supposed to evolve past us? Well, well look, I like there's a part of me that that gets that. I mean, like, um, and I, I think Joe Rogan says it a lot too. He just says, look, I we're here to uh, innovate. We're here to develop and create things, right? And I think he he all he always says he's like you know if an alien group came to Earth and why had we had to describe to them you know what humans are they didn't know and they haven't seen us yet before you know he says I would describe to them that we are we are beings that just build and create stuff. I mean, really, it's kind of what we do, and then we're just at the end of the day trying to derive meaning out of it all, right? But I think that, um, <clears throat> I think I, I just, I understand that argument. However, I don't think that that should mean that we just bend over and take this and that we yeah. don't take precautions, right? Because at the end of the day, I also think what we're here to do and what we've always done in human history is to defend ourselves and to seek safety and survival in fact uh, you know i talk about this all the time how our psychology is literally wired to survive i mean that that's its main priority and reproduce right so mm -hmm. 
Well, I think let me ask you a question here because you're bringing up something that I think is the, it should be the default reaction for most people, whether you're one of these technologists that gets all nihilistic and says that there's, it's all inevitable enemies. So why do we care? But most people, most human beings that have a heart and a brain in them, like yourself, they have this intuitive, natural knee jerk response of this isn't right. And why do you think that is? Why do you think when you hear that this is just the next inevitable step in evolution, why you're like, I don't like it? Because I think AI is completely and disproportionately different than, and this might sound like an obvious statement, but let me still unpack it, is completely mm -hmm. different than any former technology we've developed in the past. I mean, you have a lot of people who use the argument of like, oh, when the printing press came out, we thought that was going to be the end for society, or we thought that the TV was going to blind us. And, you know, and it's like, look, yes, uh, I understand that there's been this trend of people and society resisting, particularly like the traditionals and the, you know, the conservatives who want to keep things the way they are, there's been always been this resistance and hesitation to new advancements. However, um, this has now gotten to a point where the consequence, it is such a powerful tool. And just like any powerful tool, the benefits are massive. I mean, AI could cure cancer in the next, you know, and sure, we, we could get into the whole conversation about how I think there already is cures for cancer. Yeah, you know, agreed. that's of my belief. However, let's just, let's just say, you know, it, let's just, you know, reason here. AI could, could solve so many issues. I mean, if you believe in climate change, if you believe in, you know, that there's no cure for cancer yet, if you believe, you know, or even just some of these diseases or some of these things, AI could cure that literally within the next, you know, year, two years, five years. In fact, if it doesn't, that probably means we did hit the, the pause button, right? Um, I heard the story about uh, how, and I don't know how much validity there is to this story, but um, I heard the story about um, a dog owner who took their dog to the vet and the vet basically said, hey, like, we're going to have to wrap it up here. Like the dog is just, you know, the, the end is coming and we're going to have to, you know, take them home, enjoy your last little bit with them and then bring them back. And we're going to have to put them down because they just thought it was he was in a terminal situation. The guy went home and went to chat GTP4 and asked like chat GTP4, hey, here's the symptoms of my dogs. Do you of my dog? Do you have any solutions, any thoughts, insights that might save his life. I don't know how he actually asked it. I'm just paraphrasing here. And ChatGTB4 basically said what was going on with the dog, what they should do going forward. And the dog owner took the dog back to the vet, told him what ChatGTB4 actually had said, and the dog was saved. And essentially, the it was a blind spot in you know when it came to the the vets analysis of what was going on with the dog like we're about to get to a point where it's going to be a liability to go to a human yeah. physician for your health <laughs> you know counsel right yep. like that that's the point we're getting to so there are just like anything it's a powerful tool and a powerful tool has really powerful benefits let's take nuclear war or nuclear mm -hmm. weapons i think in a way you could argue that nuclear war or, or maybe the inventor of, of them, or someone who's played a pivotal role in them, or maybe even just nuclear weapons in general, should win the Nobel Peace Prize, because it's arguably the biggest deterrent for war since they've been developed, right? I mean, we aren't getting conscripted to wars, or our parents weren't, because of the advancements in, in nuclear weapons, right? So it's like, but equally, because it's such a powerful tool, sure, it might be the biggest deterrent we've ever had in history for war and saved who knows how many lives because no one wants to actually press the button because the negative consequences are absolutely catastrophic. So we're getting to a point where, yes, these advancements can inevitably come with hesitation reasonably, but at the same time, the consequences are so, so big and profound yeah. that to me, I, I kind of forget your original question. It was why do you have the knee jerk reaction that yeah, it's wrong? That's to my take biggest concern, right? So mm -hmm. I, I have a huge tolerance 
for uncertainty, for the future, for new technologies, for whatever, if the consequences of it going bad, if the worst case scenario isn't the apocalypse, and we're now facing uh, another new technology, because there's only been maybe a few, but we're, we're now facing another technology that the worst case scenario is catastrophic. It's the end of human civilization as we know it. And that to me is my knee jerk reaction of like, hey, if I listen to all these experts on AI, if I listen to all these intellectuals who dip their toes in and or like dive deep into everything you can know about AI, and if they all have a different opinion, you know, some are saying, oh, it's going to be okay, you know, the kill switch thing, Neil deGrasse Tyson or whatever. And then many are saying, whoa, like we need to pump, pump the brakes, like Elon Musk and all these other people who signed the declaration or whatever to hit the pause button for six months. And then you have some people who are in the middle who are just saying, you know what, like, I honestly don't know. When I hear that we're diving in and we're getting corporations who, again, are highly motivated to just generate more income and more innovation and more progress so that they can make more money for their shareholders. And then the government has, you know, potential to use this to infringe on our rights and freedoms and to gain more power and control. When I see that we have this situation going on and no one can really tell us where this is headed, I mean, who the fuck wouldn't be afraid? Yeah. Yeah, it speaks to a point that I brought up early in this conversation when I was bringing up Max Tegmark's uh, assertion that this is the final human weapon that we're actually talking about right now. We're not talking about this new quaint technology that's going to help uh, our labor forces, uh, you know, take away all the mundial, uh, the mundane work out of the workforce that we can just focus on being humans and enjoying your life. This is this is the utopian version uh, that absolutely obfuscates all of the negative outcomes of this. Why would he call it the last human weapon? Well, I'll take uh, an example that Dan Carlin used in one of his pod podcasts about uh, nuclear war and their deterrence. And he brought up the Manhattan Project again, where after the first initial bomb was ignited as a test and Ottenheimer was on uh, recording saying that I have become death destroyer of worlds. It was at that very moment that he realized that all of humanity had just entered into an experiment. And he said, the experiment is how long can human beings have this power of this knowledge and not destroy themselves. And he said, we will forever be in that experiment until we fail it. And the only way we fail it is when we destroy ourselves. So we're forever for the rest of time, as far as that knowledge is concerned, as long as it doesn't get extinguished, we are always going to be in the experiment of can we have this knowledge without destroying ourselves? Now, that was the previous man's most powerful weapon. What is the difference with now the, the final weapon in Tegmark's consideration? is because we are no longer the arbiters of the experiment here. It's not whether or not this will destroy humanity. It's if it does, we don't have the decision. We're the ones that decide not to push the button. We're giving that over happily to something else and presuming that it won't. So we're handing over the reins of our own potential destruction to something that we don't even understand. We think that we do. So many people are like, oh, you're taking this way too far. We're talk you're talking about language models that are just predictive text. I'm like, yeah, this is the nubile version of what's coming. This is the infantile first experimental public version of what's happening. There are, I mean, it is guaranteed to become exponentially more powerful than that. And to believe that we have control over it is, I think, an absolute uh, experiment in uh, uh, hubris at the very least, if not idiocy. And... It is the final weapon, I believe. And the reason why I would say that I have that knee-jerk reaction is probably more towards that first way that this could break, where we end up building a god with no soul, is that what is worth being a human for? What is the quality? What is the value of humanity? It is the hard question. It is what consciousness is. It is what experience is. It's the meaning of life. No matter what you answer that question, it all comes back to meaning and experience. And if you don't have an experience of what it is to be 
and you have everything other than that, you're missing the whole point. And this is what possibly we're building to replace ourselves with, where if there were aliens coming to this planet, like you were saying in Joe Rogan's example, and they're say, seeing things that just create things and, and perpetuate things, maybe 10, 15, 100 years from now, they're going to come to the planet and just see a shell of what used to be here. And the whole surface is covered with technology that has no soul it has no heart it has no experience it is the the empty carapace of what used to be life and beauty and value and that's why i think the intuitive response for people is this is bad this isn't just the next step in evolution this is the end of all that it is worth to be alive yeah you know to use uh, that is terrifying to use nuclear weapons as an example at least humans are in control of it you know they're the ones that are going to decide to push the button and and that has its own set of yeah that's scary enough (laughs) you know that's scary enough because you know you you look at some of the you know i mean you look at someone like putin right it's like you hear that he has cancer and he might be terminally ill he's getting old you know what happens when he just does it when he has no fucks to give right like Mm -hmm. He can press the button or if he goes, who's his predecessor? You know, it's like it really can come down. And to my understanding, has come down in our favor in the past to just one individual or individuals who in that moment decide not to. Right. Yeah. So that has its own uh, terrifying, terrifying consequences. But like it gets taken to a whole new level when we lose that control and that's essentially what's happening is eventually inevitably it's like this thing is going to get more intelligent than us right and at that point i mean we're basically just living on a prayer and and that's a very very terrifying thing give us some good news because dude i'm not gonna lie this podcast has and i've listened to quite a few podcasts on ai this podcast has made me more to and and not and I don't think it's in a way like I don't I don't get any sense of just you catastrophizing this or a defeatist mindset like I I think I have a pretty good radar for like a defeatist scarcity you know kind of catastrophic catastrophic uh, mindset and I, I I really think you have a rational approach here and it's scaring the shit out of me I'm not gonna lie like yeah and you know I. I Look, one of my favorite quotes that I've been saying a lot lately is that in which can be destroyed by the truth should be. Mm. So you've just you've disrupted my inner you've destroyed my inner peace a little bit here today and you've scared me, but you've scared me because you're just laying out the truth. Right. And you're not also just saying this is an an absolute certainty that this is going to happen. You're simply just laying out like, hey, here's the situation that we're faced with. And it's absolutely terrifying. And I 100% agree with you. Leave us, if you can, and if you can't, that's Mm -hmm. fine, on some good news. Like, or maybe even can you, to the best of your ability, lay out a potential scenario where we're okay here. And although there might be some bumps along the road, it doesn't destroy human civilization as we know it. Well, it's actually a really fortuitous timing that we're talking about this because I just recorded my own podcast yesterday that came out today uh, talking exactly about this. Because like I said, when I heard that podcast with Tagmark and I heard him bring up the example of Moloch and I read into the philosophy behind that, um, I had been fucked up for like a week, depressive level fucked up knowing and feeling like everything is for naught. And and I got seriously nihilistic, which is absolutely uncharacteristic for me. I'm the type of person that wants to talk about the benefits and wants to talk about the, the way out and the good things at the end of the rainbow. And I couldn't see any of it because I'm just seeing like all of the moral and ethical problems and issues that I want to stand up for really don't matter anymore because this greediest and selfish people in society are going to lead us off the cliff all as one. And, but I I took the time and did the introspective work, very, very painful introspective work, because nothing about this is intuitive that there is a good side to it, which I hate. I absolutely hate that. You want to talk about just space now for the last week, but I've come to the conclusion through doing that. There is a quote, I think this is Nietzsche, who said that uh, be 
be aware not to stare into the abyss, else the abyss stare back into you. And I've been staring into that abyss and I've been watching this demon of Moloch stare back into me and, and devalue everything that I thought was valuable. But Peterson had another take on that. And he said, that's just for the first while while you stare into the abyss, because to ignore the abyss is not going to change that it's there. And the longer you stare into the abyss, your eyes will start to adjust for it and you can actually see your enemy in the face. And I believe that after enough time of me looking at this, I've come to the conclusion that for all the reasons of the easy and the hard questions of consciousness, that we still, we all know that each individual one of us is conscious, but we can't define what that is. There is something in that reason that there is a hard question, that there is something valuable and experiential to being, to existing, that not only is the most valuable thing, but it actually seems to be the answer and the counter to raw derivative logic. And scenarios like Moloch, where logically there is no way that any of our human systems uh, escape it, and scenarios like AI, where logically there is no way that humanity can exist next past this next step of technological evolution. In the moment of existential crisis, and there's been all sorts of them throughout time up to this point, humanity somehow gets to look back on that and figure out how they got through it. They never know how they get through it in the moment of, you know, the the Cold War, we were doomed. People were doing tests uh, at schools to duck and cover under, you know, for a nuclear fallout. And there was the, the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis where everything was going to come down. Every single day, people were under the, the specter, the auspice of immediate uh, obliteration. And for some unforeseen reason we not only got through that but we continue through that and i think that there is something that me and you we just can't see right now that exists at the human level of total community existence that is battling these demons and that always has that this is not a new battle and there's something to the joy and the hope that exists within an experiencing person that uh is worth doing the moral and ethical work to stand up for what's right, depending on what you think that is, and that the value in that is actually the antidote and the Achilles heel to these logical conundrums. And I just, I come back to something that I know a lot of people who are rooted in science, especially in the AI spaces and others, they hate hearing this. And it's, it's not the most um, fulfilling answer, but it comes down to faith. And I do believe that having a strong faith in joy, in hope, in love, in the value of being is the antidote to nihilism. Yeah, Elon Musk, I believe, said, I'd rather be optimistic and wrong than pessimistic and right. I almost think we have like a moral obligation to essentially have faith and be optimistic, right? We don't always have to be positive. Positive is in any moment just, you know, pretending either things are good and you acknowledge that or it's pretending that things are good when they're actually not but i think at the end of the day because we don't actually have the ability to know what's coming down the pipeline you could maybe call it a moral obligation or maybe you could just call it hey what do we have if we don't have the ability to believe in a better future yeah. to believe that we're going to be okay and i think as soon as you lose that foundational belief i think that the meaning of life uh, starts to slip away and you get into that nihilistic framework kind of mind set and that's a dangerous place to be. I think that one thing that comes up for me is, I mean, look, if you look at humans, it is of my belief, it is my belief that humans are essentially, if you look at our subconscious mind, I mean, we have our conscious mind and that would be, you know, a lot to do with our the consciousness that we have. Mm -hmm. And then we have the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind is very much an automatic autopilot computer like program that you could argue has a lot of parallels uh, in large part to uh, an AI system. So if you look at the way in which we're developed, I think that we're born kind of with a clean slate. Sure, there's generational trauma, which is, you know, pretty much proven to be real at this point, something I really believe in. You know, there are genetics and, and predispositions that we have. But essentially, we're in large part a clean slate. And it is then our environment and our experiences 
that develop this code essentially which is our emotions our beliefs that get instilled in us from the evidence from our environments and experiences that then create you know who we are as a person and 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 what we do going forward so if you look at you know some people say well how can we live in a world where some people end up a you know serial killer uh or someone like you know fill in the blank horrible person right in our human history and then you have someone who is you know who just has so much love to give and it's just such a good ethically and moral ethic and ethically and morally a good person the differences in that are the environments and the experiences the difference in that is how we were conditioned and i guess to, that's my belief um i don't really believe everyone i think a lot of people will say i believe everyone is inherently good like from the get-go i actually don't know that i hold that belief i i don't think everyone is, is inherently good i think that everyone has the inherent psychology that is primed to just survive right mm -hmm. and that is in itself a powerful tool and i think that if we grow up in an experience and an environment full of love and care and attention right and our basic human needs are met and we have minimal trauma at, at least no big t trauma then i think a human is very inclined to be conditioned to be good i think if a human grows up in an environment where there's big T trauma, where the basic human needs aren't met, where uh, we don't get a lot of love, care and attention, then I think we can be developed into doing horrible things or be inclined to do horrible things in this world. I think we could parallel that to maybe the AI. Maybe this can give us hope in that if AI is in a lot of ways, and you can tell me if I'm far off here, if you believe I'm far off, I'm not going to be offended in the least, because again, in this topic, I'm a dummy, uh, Drew, but if we could parallel that to AI, well, maybe we could say, if, if AI does become sentient and conscious, well, maybe it won't have an evil agenda if we do it right, if we actually give it uh, in a weird way, this might sound really strange, but if we give it its basic needs, right? And if it is, if it feels like it actually, like if it can derive meaning out of connection, like if we can actually develop a relationship with it, if we can actually learn to coexist with it, I think that we can actually instill empathy, compassion, love, connection, meaning, fulfillment purpose we can instill those in the consciousness of the ai if we do it properly i don't see based on my very limited knowledge of how these systems work i don't see how there's a huge difference between the way in which we we get conditioned as humans and, and ai gets conditioned am i just is this just a pipe dream am i just uh no you're not the only over here you're not the only one who thinks that. I've heard this from a few different people, and it is the most optimistic take you can take on this. I actually love to play around in this thought space. Um, that It's predicated on a few different things. I mean, the first of all is, is AI going to uh, continue to mimic us as it becomes more intelligent and possibly sentient, or is it going to become something that we've never become because it's simply not us? Uh, we won't know until we get there, unfortunately. But there is uh, another part of this scenario. When we talk about the alignment issue of whether or not AI is going to continue to be in, in alignment with our goals, it's actually, I heard another guy recently say that this could be a two-way street where maybe there's an alignment issue the other direction is are we aligned with ai's goals and if we're only expecting it to be in alignment with us well that's an abusive relationship that maybe it's going to break that bond and maybe we're better off trying to uh, cooperate with it than trying to restrain it for our own good um, I hope that that's the case. I hope that we could be beneficiaries of each other instead of adversaries at whatever level. Yeah, because can I interject? So like, mm -hmm. um, there's this fundamental difference about, I think, our agenda. And again, this is now talking into if AI is sentient or conscious or it gets there. Like, you know, I think it was Richard Dawkins that wrote the selfish gene, right? Yep. Like, I, I do believe in that. Like, that's that's how we've evolved. That's that's essentially. Sorry, my phone is ringing here. Give me one sec. Yep. Um, 
I, I'll be down in a second. I'm just recording something. I'll be down in a few minutes. Hello? Yeah, so I think it was Richard Dawkins that wrote The Selfish Gene, where in that, you know, that's how we've evolved. That's how we've survived is like we have inherently in our conditioning the, the desire to procreate, you know, spread our seed, grow and survive, right? At the end of the day, that's what we're really motivated to do based on evolution. That's just how we've evolved. But if you look at AI, why would we assume that they would have the same agenda if they don't have the same origins and evolutionarily evolutionary process as we do, right? So maybe they don't have this agenda of like, I have to, maybe that's, I think where our greed and our power and our control comes from is because for most of human history, you had to be greedy. You had to, you know, at all costs, help yourself and your family survive. And now I just think we live in a totally different environment in that, you know, we've had some dictators, some people who have a lot of power who just are operating based on operating from that same agenda and those same principles in our conditioning, but yet just have, I guess, more powerful tools to do greater damage. Why would we assume that AI would have those same kind of uh, intentions or agendas? Yeah, psychologically speaking, it is basically um, what people fear the most is generally the worst of themselves that they project onto other people, right? So if you're right, most right. concerned that you're going to be attacked, maybe it's because you know that in the same situation you would attack somebody, right? Yeah. And and so that could be a a flaw in the whole idea of why would we assume that AI would have the same flaws that we do? Um, just because we have them. First of all, that comes back to what is consciousness and all we have is our knowledge of what we are and then we project it onto other things and, and try to see, is this thing conscious based off of human consciousness? Well, maybe it is conscious in a different degree that that is not human. Maybe that's a good thing. You know, maybe the alignment issue is more of an, a problem among humans where among humanity, there's no alignment. There's there's an alignment issue within humans. We can't align with ourselves. And so we're projecting that onto an AI that's, well, if we can't align with ourselves and we're building it, well, then it's not going to align with us. Maybe it becomes the balance of our disalignment and it can be sort of this uh, guiding father or like the, the human and the dog. If we become the dog in the scenario, uh, maybe the, the human is there to teach us how to uh, behave properly and, and keep us in alignment against our own worst nature. But again, not to end on a bad note, because we've got to wrap up here. But again, the fact that we just the fact that we just don't know the fact that some of the smartest people in the world are pondering a bunch of different scenarios to no one really, there's not a unanimous agreeance on like, well, here's the most likely outcome. Like we just we, we just don't know at all. Not only yeah. do we just not know, there's no, there's not no unanimous agreeance on a positive outcome, even if you were to ask them, okay, well, what's the most positive or likely outcome there? It's all going to be different. What's the, the worst outcome? What are the chances there? It's all going to be different from depending on who you talk to. And most people are just kind of putting up their hands and saying, well, we just don't know. And that is the, the greatest fear. I think obviously that I have is just like, like, when the consequences are so huge, we're operating an experiment and we always will be, like you said, where if it doesn't go, not even worst case scenario, it's just if it doesn't go in the direction we want to, it's it's going to mean grave consequences. And that's just a very, very terrifying thing. But there are things, it, it, hey, there is a very thin line in human psychology or just our our. Uh, feeling of uh, the of our emotions and our regulating our emotions there's a very thin line between anxiety and excitement mm. one of the things that i do as a and i've always done this because i've always dealt with anxiety i've certainly come a, a long way to a point where my anxiety might be quote unquote just a, an average although i hate to use that or normal i hate to use those words but um, uh, you know, I, I feel like I can regulate my emotions, but I still experience anxiety like we all do. And I get anxiety from stuff like this when I really, you know, go down the rabbit hole. I have these kind of discussions. One of the, the 
tools that I use is to just really switch your, it's just a difference in perspective, right? They're in terms of how you feel them in the body, how the nervous system responds and the, the chemicals that are released very similar anxiety and excitement so just changing your perspective to okay yes this is scary but it's also exciting what an exciting time to be alive right i use this on planes not so much anymore because my fear of flying i used to have a really big fear of flying oh. um and when i used to have a big fear of flying and i would have in be in a plane where there'd be turbulence instead of thinking thoughts about like, what if the plane goes down? What if this, that, and the other thing happens? I just simply changed my perspective to like, I'm like on a fucking roller coaster ride here. I'm in this big tube at like 30,000 feet up in the air. And like, we're, we're going at an incredible speed and we're bouncing up and down. And I would just change that perspective to like, what an exciting thing that I'm experiencing. And it sounds like, well, you'd never be able to do that in that scenario. You really can, and it really makes a difference. So when I start to think about all these things that I'm concerned about, a lot of people say to me, like, how do you deal with this? You're immersed in this world of whether it's like government infringement or government power and greed or the pharmaceutical situation, pharmaceutical companies and just, you know, AI and nuclear war and all these things. How do you remain at peace? And that is honestly a big tool that I use is like, I more so choose to look at it as like, you know what? I could have been born on any time to be alive. You know, I would have way rather been living through this than I would have, you know, Nazi Germany or World War Two or, you know, even World War One or, you know, go back in history. I would way rather be living during these times. They're exciting times to be alive. Drew, we got to wrap it up, brother. I really appreciate you coming on. If you have any final thoughts, please. Uh, now's a good time. And then um, tell people where you want them to go or what you want them to do at this point. Yeah, that was a really good summary and a great place to wrap it up, Kayla. I'm glad that we, you know, we always try to end with some sort of beneficial message message because nobody wants to be the naysayer and the doomsayer out there. But I mean, it is what it is. Um, and I would I would echo what you say that uh, to go back in time, like, look, we're thankfully humans have been around long enough that we can know who we are. And there are great people in the past that can help you learn how to know who you are. Uh, the, the Stoics are a great example. The Buddhists are a great example. And it all comes back to knowing the self and coming back to the self. Cause there's so much that can go wrong at the world level that I'm sorry, you just don't have any say in. And uh, one of the uh, tropes, I guess, in psychology is that um, depression is worrying about the past and anxiety is worrying about the future. And the answer to that is to stay in the present, which speaks back to Buddhism, it speaks back to Stoicism, it speaks back to meditation, it's just know who you are, be, be confident in who you are, enjoy who you are, enjoy the moment you're at, there's no point worrying about the past or the future if it means that all you're going to do is just not enjoy the present, which is all we have. So in, I guess, a holistic way, really try not to allow these thoughts to permeate your mind to the point that you no longer enjoy your existence. Cause no matter what happens, look, the, we may be hit by a meteor tomorrow. Does that mean that we have to worry about that every day? It shouldn't because then we, we miss the, the joy and the value of the experience of existence anyways. So I guess I'll, I'll leave it there. And if people want to check me out, I've got uh, my own podcast called the social disorder podcast. I've had Kayla on there as well. And um, you can check out my book, which is available everywhere called consciousness, reality, and purpose, where we talk about a lot of this stuff. That's so cool, brother. I am so happy you came on today. I actually like enjoyed this conversation beyond what I thought I would. I was very excited to begin with, but this was really powerful and i think that these are just conversations that i think are important to have not because you know again you mentioned we don't have a whole lot of control over it. and i think again another great point in that you can take the stoic approach of like realizing that we just don't have a whole lot of control over this as individuals unfortunately uh, although you could make an argument that if enough of us band together and speak uh, out about our concerns that maybe we do force a pause uh, in this we can also fight against, you know, one of the biggest concerns I know for my audience and me is government, uh, again, government uh, overstep and overreach uh, using these technologies to gain power and control. And I think that at the end of the day, we got to talk about these and we have to speak yeah. up because, you know, polls create policies and uh, we can push back and stop the government from abusing these technologies. 
But not only that, I, I just think these conversations are important to have so that we can all get on the same page and be able to manage our anxieties over this because it's about to get fucking crazy. It's already getting crazy and it's going to get crazier. So I, I really, really appreciate you taking the time coming on, Drew. This was, uh, this was really, really a fascinating conversation. Absolutely. My pleasure as always, Kaylor. Thanks a lot.